is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favorite. Ooh, it's our golden-eyed boy. He just looks ready for a fight. She is making a bold statement that this is still her territory. Look at these shots! That is absolutely epic. Good old body and welcome to episode two of Safari Lives, our weekly highlights package of the characters of Safari Live. We are coming to you live, as always, from two locations in Africa, the Maasai Mara, all the way up in Kenya, and here at Juma on the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park. This week's show is action-packed and filled with interesting things, mostly cat. I am on the trail of Shidulu on foot, as you can see. I have no vehicle around me at all. We have got the inevitable Mexican standoff going on between Hukumuri and Tingana. Hosanna is staying under the radar. Tandi and Cub have had a wonderful week indeed. And Shidulu, who I am following, is hopefully having a drink of water at a pan not too far from here. All the way up in the Mara, we'll give you an update on the North Clan of Hyenas, Naratoi and her cubs, and they there was an, even a lion that thought it was a monkey. Week two of Safari Live sees Tandi, the new queen of Juma, and her daughter, seven-month-old Tlalamba, sneaking through the long, late summer grass. Shidulu, Duchess of the North, hunts Nyala, albeit unsuccessfully in the golden late evening. Tingana's health continues to improve, so perhaps he's not quite ready to relinquish his dukedom just yet. Osana, the little chief, spends a frustrating few days hunting and staying out of trouble. Mara, the rain continues to pelt down every afternoon, and the youngsters of the North Clan are forced to seek shelter underground from time to time. Meanwhile, Naratoi and her two cubs revel in a brief patch of warming sun. Now, please do talk to us during the course of the show. Of course, you can use the hashtags Fire Live on Twitter. Otherwise, you can use the chat stream on YouTube. Now, for those of us who are getting on, of course, exercise becomes more and more important. Tingana seems to believe in that very strongly. Good. Tingana moved south after we saw him hunting on the show last week. He stuck to the dry Mromati River and spent much of Tuesday snoozing before continuing down to Chitwa Dam for some peace and quiet. Good afternoon, welcome everybody. Once again, another episode of Safari Lives here in a beautiful Saturday afternoon in Juma in South Africa. It is beautiful 30 degrees, only 30 degrees Celsius and 68, sorry, no, 78 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a marvelous day here and we have had an exceptional week when it comes to our characters. The Bushwalk team has been on fire and we've had characters popping up all over the place as I'm sure you will be seeing as the show goes on. Um, and what a day. We are out this afternoon and we have managed to relocate on a small group of male lions. Now, wait for it. It is very exciting. They are lying down behind me. And uh, we cannot really even see them. There they are. A puddle or pile of avoca male lions. So it's my first time seeing them. And I'm not going to lie and tell you that I'm overjoyed. Um, I was hoping for a little bit more drama, a little bit more anticipation. And uh, they are here right up on the northern boundary with Bufusuk. They're about 30, 40 meters into Bufusuk. We cannot um, move a few more meters forward, but we've got them here on the very prominent hippo path coming down. Bufusuk Dam sitting just behind us. And they are enjoying themselves a little bit of lion slumber as they enjoy 
just a little bit of cuddle session as well in the afternoon sunshine as uh, we are sitting here in the the non-shade because they haven't even kind enough to to position themselves somewhere where we can get some shade but that is the way it works don't forget this is 100 percent live and we are hoping also to catch up on with some of the other characters later on in the show as things develop the bushwalk team as i said is on fire and you have already been with james and they are out searching and it seems as if brent leo smith has already found a beautiful character and she's moving Yes, we have indeed. We are with the beautiful Tandy, and hidden in the grass close by here is the wonderful little Tlalamba. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? Now, they managed to kill a Stian Bok this morning, but we're going to look at that a little bit later while I reposition to get us a view, hopefully, of both the cub and Tandy. Uh, let's go have a look at how we found her early this week on foot. We spot Tandy on foot, peering at us through some thick grass. We watch her watching us and call a vehicle in to see if Kalamba is with her. From the vehicle, we are lucky enough to get a beautiful view of Kalamba slinking off into the thickets following after her mom. What makes seeing Tandy so on foot so special is that she is one of the hardest leopards to track and find. Oh, listen to her, she's calling for the cub. Can you just hear that? Now we have had a few brief visuals of Kalamba doing some slinking again. She's, there she is, there she is, Dev. Look in the golden light just behind Tandy. There you've got her. To the right. To the right. There we go. There she is. Hello, beautiful. There's the little slinker. Slinking up on mom. She might jump on mom. Here we go. They're heading towards the Sternbok carcass that Tandy managed to catch this morning. So they haven't put it up in the tree. You can see she's trying to cover the stomach content now to hide the smell from any potential predators such as hyenas. Isn't this awesome? Where is little Tlalamba now? She was on her way. We are probably about two kilometers from where we saw her on foot, but quite close to where we found her this morning, Bobby. Um, we are between Cheetah Cut Line and Drakensberg Road to the east of Mumba. I'll show you on the map a little bit later. I just want to stay with the cats now while she's calling for the cub. And the cub's hidden right there somewhere. I'm playing hide and go seek with mom. She might pounce out onto Tandy. Quite often I'm just watching the grass. There she is. There she is. How did you sneak up so quietly? Hi, Aiden. Aiden is only seven years old. It's so nice to have you on this drive, Aiden. Aiden, they like to eat meat, but generally small to medium sized antelope. So a Stenborg is a perfect meal for Tandy and Tlalamba. Isn't this absolutely gorgeous being able to see these intimate moments between cub and mom? As I say, she's one of the most difficult animals to follow and track. She's been doing lots of loop-de-loops. Oh, she's doing a little stretch on the tree and just out of sight there you can hear her claws gripping into the branch. Uh, what is little Tlalamba going to do? 
Are you going to follow mom? Or are you going to keep watching? Now they've both had a really good feed today. Dave, let me just maybe move a little bit forward for you, for Tandy. There we go. Oh, look at that. There she is, up in the tree, getting her claws in. Oh, she's jumping right up the tree. But across to the Mara, quickly. Guilty that I'm not there sharing that moment with Tundi and her gorgeous little cub. Because, of course, Tundi is my favorite leopard. Either way, Saturdays are our favorite day here in the Maasai Mara. Because, of course, it's when we get to go live and share with you the amazing things that we have seen over the course of the week. So both Tristan and myself are really looking forward to telling you about just what we've been up to while you've been following the various cats on Juma. It is April in the Maasai Mara now. The Mara ecosystem is this massive area behind me. We're looking out on the beautiful open plains. And it gets on average around about 1,400 millimeters of rain, which equates to about 55 inches. And most of it falls in April. Have a look at what it's done to the roads. This is the Magoro drainage line, or lugger, and that over there is Scar's favorite gardenia bush. I don't know where he's gone, but I imagine that he has moved somewhere where it's just a little bit drier. Normally we go through here without a second thought, but the river is so full that it's actually flowing back up this lugger itself. This is the only way to get across. This is a bridge, believe it or not, and fortunately there are posts to mark out the edge of the bridges, otherwise we'd just have to guess. Have a look at that. Welcome to Mara in the wet season. Fortunately, we are well prepared for this entire process. As you can see, I've got my shumbrella, which is a shuka-made umbrella. But you can well imagine what the poor animals must go through with this amount of rain. Of course, it's not... Well, we are moving away from the lions. We apologize for the Mara disappearing. Maybe it's the downpour of rain and the flooding that is happening there. But we are going to leave these guys that are doing absolutely nothing at the moment. And we weren't anticipating them doing much. But we're going to go to Bivolsuk Dam. Uh, let's go have a look at how many of the goslings are still ducking around, shall we? I think that is very exciting. That those parents are parents and for the last two weeks or so they've still got seven of the eight okay well while we get over to Buffalo Dam let's go over to Chitra Dam with Ralph Kirsten Well, here we are in the southeastern corner of our traverse, and we're at Chitwa Dam. What a wonderful afternoon it is. It is nice and warm, and the hippos are quite enjoying the lazy afternoon here in the water. And I tell you what, it's been very interesting with the dynamics of Tingana and Hosanna, his son, having been moved away from the area and the upheaval because of Hukumuri moving into the area with um, Shuduli, the female, as well there. It seems like there's a bit of a love relationship going on with those two and a bit of a conflict that's been happening, as I'm sure James has mentioned, uh, between Hukumuri and the in indomitable uh, Tingana. But it seems like Tingana's more on that uh, side where he's decided to move off into the southeastern section um, and Hukumuri now up in that northwestern side with Shuduli. So it's very interesting indeed. And he's now given the place for Hukumuri to stay there. And, um, well, that's very interesting because we're going to look around in this area and see if we can actually find these guys. But um, I tell you what, let's head off uh, to the guys on foot. We track Hosanna on foot down into the Mdlawati River where he allows us very close into his personal space. Not perturbed at all, he nonchalantly begins grooming while we watch on. Hosanna is such a beautiful cat and walks with real confidence. 
I hope that his confidence helps him through the turbulence of having Okumuri enter the area. So, that was very interesting indeed. And Hosanna now has sort of followed on behind Tingana, his father. They've got a very interesting relationship between the two of them uh, because leopards are normally very solitary. And, uh, well, Tingana, uh, he allows Hosanna to be very close to him very regularly. And with Tingana now moving away from where Hukumuri has moved in, um, Hosanna seems to have followed him. So, so that is quite uh, different to what we're used to with that little relationship between a father and son. But, well, very interesting indeed. And we're going to be circling around the area and trying to pick up on some tracks and see if we can actually find these guys because they've been around Chitwa Dam quite regularly. And we've also got our eye in the sky um, with a bird's eye view that we can actually just scour the area, see what's happening around this beautiful water point that we do have have uh, at Chitwa Dam. There's, uh, there's a few pods of hippos and um, there's a lot of birds that have been around as well and we're listening out for any alarm calls. But um, I think we're going to start up shortly and see if we can find these cats. Uh, and speaking of cats, there are some others that I think you should take a look at. There we go. Tandy has done something you don't see her do too often. She has launched herself into the top of the weeping wattle. Little Shalamba is still watching from the ground. Oh, she's just stood up. You can just see her through the grass there. What are you, what are you doing? Are you going to go join your mother up on top of the tree? Now, I don't see too many insects around that might cause her to go up the tree. I, I think Tandy just might be in a good mood. And she's decided to bound up the pelter for him. Now, of course, Tandy is, is getting a little bit long in the tooth, but by no means, Percy, will this be her last cub. I think she probably got an, another cub or two left in her. Uh, of course, a lot of that all depends on outside circumstances, pressure from different males or even pressure from the Shadulu female coming in. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the next little while with the current shift in leopard dynamics. Come, Kalamba, go climbing the tree. This morning you were the one climbing the tree and your mom was on the ground. Now the roles have been reversed. I think she's got too fat of a tummy and just enjoying snoozing on the cool sand under the tree instead. And she is keeping a close look at Mom. Her head resting on that little branch there for a second. You want me to go back a little bit, Dev? I'm just going to go back a little bit so we can get a better view of Kalamba. Got her through there. There we go. Um, left. Center frame. You happy there or forward or back? Forward a touch. Okay, there we go. <laughs> She's got a nice little chin rest there. Now, if I remember correctly, she was born in October. Was she? No. She must have been born later than that. Uh, I wasn't here when Columbo was born. When was she born? Dave, you were here? I'm not sure. I think she's about f between four and five months old. So what month are we in now? May. So she must have been born maybe November, December. Yeah, somewhere around there. So I'd say just under five months old now. And I really do love little leopards as they get into this, this sort of age. They become far more playful and uh, 
brave and, and comfortable in their own skin and uh, they can give us some incredible sightings. Care indeed they do. Leopard cubs grow a huge amount within their first year. Uh, they go from tiny little sausages uh, to almost the same size as mom, or particularly a, a little male. Oh, look at that. A lovely light on her eyes. Just keeping a, a careful watch on all the ongoings around, checking mom up in the tree. Uh, we are extremely privileged to be able to spend time with these two wonderful leopards. Now you can see Tundi's quite camouflaged from where we are now, up high in the tree. Dave can't even find her. Can you find her, Dave? There we go, Dave. Look at that. You can see her rosettes through the soft leaves of the weeping wattle. It is always amazing when you look away from a distance and you can see how those animals completely disappear. Yeah, well, we're going to play the patience game with Tandi and Klalamba. Hopefully, Klalamba will get playful as the afternoon gets cooler. In the meantime, we're going to send you back to the Mara. Us fighting off the gremlins, that's the last time I ever open an umbrella inside, even if it is a shumbrella. Though we're sorry about that, but we are back live, and I can finally finish what I was trying to tell you. You've heard about all of the dynamics with the various cats on Juma, whether it's the lions and the avoca males or the shift in territories within the leopards. But I have to tell you about the animals that we regularly see in the Mara. Do you remember the sausage tree pride? That's the one that Brent had catching a buffalo not too long ago. I think it was on Valentine's Day, actually. And the one with the lioness with the broken tail. Well, they've been, uh, typically in the year that we've been in the Mara, they've been moving around this area here, towards the escarpment and then along this road, and quite far away from where we've been finding them now, which is down here towards the salt lick and in fact both Tristan and myself have had some spectacular sightings with the sausage tree pride that we're going to tell you about over the course of this episode too and we're both really looking forward to sharing those experiences but remember when you watch the various updates that we have to share with you don't forget to look out for the lioness with the broken tail now, you have a leopard in a tree on a Juma. Have a look at some of the strange behavior exhibited by the lions here in the Mara. One of the unusual sights that we occasionally see in the Maasai Mara is the sight of a lion up in a tree. But I have to tell you that this is the first time that I have ever seen a fully grown male lion reclining on the branch of a tree as if it were a leopard. It is right in the middle of the day and it is a very, very warm day. And that helps to explain why our male lion battled his way up there and found himself at that comfortable spot. Lions are perfectly capable of climbing up trees if they want to. It's getting down that might be the interesting part to watch. Few weeks we are really hoping to introduce you to those particular characters but how weird was it to see that male lion looking as comfortable as he did perched up reclining looking just like one of our juma leopards uh, we know him as one of the old donio pike male lions now that's one of the prides that we've got to know in the southwestern corner so if i take us back all the way towards the map remember how we talked last week about naratoi and where she is there is a big pride of quite skittish lions that particularly like this corner over here of the Mara. Now, with the rains being as they are, this is where we're expecting the migration or some of the first herds of wildebeest to move up from the Serengeti into the Maasai Mara. This is all speculation, but there's vast amounts of rain on, in Tanzania. Now, unfortunately, Joy, 
we do not know. We, we, we do get some updates on the Black Rock Pride, but unfortunately the Black Rock Pride are over here, they're down here, and at the moment we are not driving throughout the National Reserve. So this is on the other side of the river, it's on the opposite side of the Mara River, which means that we cannot actually travel there for now. So we know that the females are alive and well. I don't know how many cubs are still wandering around, hopefully all nine. We have no reason to believe otherwise. We also know that Imani took, Imani, remember she's the female cheetah. Um, and one of my personal favorites, this is why I know all about her. She went across the Sand River with three tiny cubs. I don't know why. I told you she was crazy. And then she's come back, unfortunately, only with one cub still in tow and is back here in this region over this sort of, this sort of talic region and those river areas. from that side of the river. Unfortunately, I don't have any further updates for you about the Black Rock Pride, but I'm hoping to get to see them very, very soon. But the pleasure has actually been in getting to know the various prides of the Triangle. We haven't spent that much time with them. And I look forward to experiencing more with them. We found very productive areas the more time that we've spent in the Triangle. And, of course, we know where those are, just in the same way that Steve would know the most productive areas to be on Juma. Yes, well, thanks, Jamie. Well, wonderful to have you on the show as well. And um, we are at Bufusuk Dam, and we are counting the goslings with the very very good parents and there are still seven which is marvelous we're very excited James Hendry said a few weeks ago that they were not very good parents and they in my books are doing very very well it's quite funny or marvelous to see them growing they're just getting bigger and bigger we watch them swim across the lake or the, the water hole and then plod or waddle out onto the other side and now busy feeding on the grass seeds on whatever other sort of vegetation matter there might be there on the floor. They are joined by the blacksmith lapwings there, which don't seem to be competing too much, seeing as the Egyptian geese are vegetarians and the lapwings are feeding on insects. It's definitely, a, you'd think, a highly contested sort of area when it comes to, to predators, and we have had the Unkuhumas here a number of times. The two avoca males are just a few, few hundred yards away from where I'm sitting right now and are they going to try stake a claim to this area going to try take it from the Birmingham boys is Tingana going to try and maintain the territories he has or is he going to concede defeat to the the new Hukumuri who is moving in these are all very interesting questions that we are sitting with and uh, we did have the old Duke middle of this week in the middle of um, Juma he wasn't calling he was looking a little bit worried, to be to be honest. Taylor had him. Kumori calling off in the distance was definitely, definitely influencing his behaviour. Let's go have a look. Taylor finds the Duke of Juma, Tingana, in the middle of his territory. Is he going to lose out to a younger, stronger male? Tingana looks concerned as he quietly surveys his old lands. So he was definitely looking concerned, the old Duke. Um, Taylor was telling me that he could hear Hukumori calling off in the distance. I think someone else was actually with Hukumori. God, I wasn't quite sure what to do. Stacy, you, you're right. They might be staying close together, Hosanna and Tingana, for the purpose of that. But I think maybe they're just lonely as well. Tingana's tolerating his young son. Excuse me, it is quite strange for him to be doing so, um, but there has been some information of other leopards that have been recorded doing the same thing. I think Osana is just finding it easier to hang around his dad, who's not giving him any negative behavior back. No doubt if Hukumori saw the little chief, there would be some influence happening. But um, marvelous that the Duke is still around and doing all sorts of things. Okay, and we're going to be moving off from Bufusuk, doing a little bit of a loop around and... Let's go have a look where the little chief has been this week. Asana appears on Sunday, drifting along a shaded dry stream in central Juma. 
he crosses the valley of the Umlomati and then turns back north for the familiar hunting grounds around Vuyatela Dam. Here, he spends a bit of time unsuccessfully trying to catch a meal, before following his father south towards Chitwa Chitwa, possibly inspired by the rasping calls of Hokomori. We've just spotted something that Hosanna might like to eat. It is a scrub hare, which we flushed from its form. It was lying under this bush over here. So Hosanna has been doing quite a lot of wandering about the place. I think very much that he's trying to stay below the radar, like I said earlier on. And, you know, the less contact he has with male leopards, the best, the better. Oh, Rexon's found the scrub hair. Let's just go and have a quick look. And that's because, of course, he is a youngster, and he will be chased out eventually by one or both of Tingana or Hukumuri. Now, <laughs> you can just see the ears, apparently, in here. We haven't found any further tracks of Shidulu. Can you see the ears there? And we're just going from water hole to water hole. Have you got them? And there's the little scrub hair. I think a lot of these things get smashed by the leopards. You know, we so often don't see them on big kills like we're watching Tandi on now. And yet, you know, they're not emaciated all the time. Sometimes they look a little bit thin, but they must be eating something. And this morning when we found Shidulu's tracks, we found the remains of a tortoise that I think she'd scavenged on. It was beastly smelly. And, of course, Hosanna ate one of these things last week. So his wanderings continue to be non-territorial, and he's just going from safe zone to safe zone. I'm talking about Hosanna, not that rabbit, of course. Oh, scrub hair. It's not a rabbit at all, really. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So that's Hosanna's story. And then the next thing that I'm going to talk about, of course, is Hukumuri and his increase, shall we say. He's upping the ante in the Mexican standoff. We don't know if he's had any contact with Tingana. I suspect probably not. Uh, you know, male leopards tend to avoid physical contact, and I've actually watched two lying right next to each other for two hours, just kind of growling and then rolling over and slovering all over the place. Very disgusting. So it's very unusual that they will actually come to blows. But... Hukumuri is starting to make his presence more felt, I think, with a song, believe it or not. Tuesday brings the usurper in from the west. Hukumuri glides through the grass like a boat on a turbulent green sea. His confidence grows daily as he solidifies his dominion over the northern parts of Juma, albeit with an itchy face. His singing voice is nothing to write home about, but the meaning and the rasping melody is all too clear. This is mine now, and I'm here to stay. So Brent always likes to say that he thinks that Hukumuri has got a very soft and pathetic rasp. Um, it's not the loudest I've ever heard. I think Brent's a little beaten about it, but certainly he seems to be well, establishing himself much more obviously, but he's not calling down all the way to the south of Tingana's old territory. He's up here in the north, and so I wonder if they won't just form themselves a, a border between each other. Now, Hosanna is an interesting case because he remains, uh, he's just over two years old. He will start hitting puberty now. He'll start to show some territorial behavior eventually. And Ali, you... I don't think that he will have any role to play in protecting Tingana. A leopard, once they leave their mothers, has absolutely no protection whatsoever. Now, we know that Hosanna, unfortunately, lost his mother in April of last year. He was barely a year old. That's very early for a male leopard. The males, rather like humans, like to spend t more time at home than the females. So that was very early for him to become independent but from that time on he has had no protection he will not provide protection to any other animal until he sires a youngster and then he will indirectly provide uh, protection by keeping other males out of his territory but there will be no 
actual physical protection. And, you know, whether or not Hosanna recognizes Tingana as his father is a difficult one to answer. I think he might. Um, and whether or not Tingana recognizes his Hosanna as his son, I think is more obvious. I think he does, because he doesn't. While he growls at Hosanna, and Hosanna seeks him out from time to time, there's definitely a tolerance there that wouldn't exist uh, were Tingana and Hukumuri to come across each other, for example. All righty. Now, somebody who has a singing voice not unlike Hukumuri is Brent Leo Smith. Except I think I can challenge Hukumuri for a bit of volume. <laughs> but Tandy's still up in the tree. Uh, she looks like she's getting herself comfy there. There's a nice breeze, as you can see. Maybe that's what's keeping her a bit cool with that belly of hers after munching on that stand for the majority of the day. A little Klalamba has disappeared into the grass, absolutely flat and fast asleep. Now, as I said, she caught this this morning, and believe it or not, we were lucky enough to be right there as it happened. Let's go take a look. Tandy is on the move through the golden morning light. Something is moving just in front of her. A Stienborg. A centimetre at a time, she moves closer and closer. Her muscles bunch and she leaps and quickly dispatches the poor Stienborg with a suffocation grip. She then moves fast along the road, dragging the carcass towards a weeping wattle thicket where little Klalamba is waiting. Wasn't that amazing? And that happened about 15 feet from us. We were really, really lucky this morning. We spent a lot of time with her, and as she patiently stalked those Stenbock on about four different occasions before she caught it. Now, of course, if she was by herself, this kill would probably last her. Uh, a day or two or maybe two days but with having to feed little Klalamba as well uh, it's likely that she will hunt again probably not tomorrow but the next day and uh, I'm hoping she does hoist it up into the tree where she is at the moment and uh, that the hyenas have no chance at stealing any of that meat from her now that's what she thinks of us she's turning her back on us now she has been doing an incredible job keeping Kalamba safe from all the different male leopards that are around, Hasana included. Now of course she has to leave little Kalamba when she goes off hunting and to answer your question yes Ali I'm sure little Kalamba is hunting all sorts of little critters while mom is away probably lizards geckos squirrels and uh, i'm pretty sure she's made her first kill already we just haven't been lucky enough to be there when it happened but i'm sure there's many a grasshopper that have fallen prey to the fierce teeth and claw of Klalamba. Oh, we can hear some parrots in the distance. Squawk! I was hoping they might come fly near us. It's a lovely light. And I have been seeing them feeding on the terminalia trees quite a bit. All the silver cluster leaves. And we're in a, an area full of cluster leaves. So it'd be nice to have a little parrot around as well. I don't I wonder how long she's going to stay up there because she is in the sun there. It's not that hot now. The temperature's dropped off a few degrees since we started the safari this afternoon. But still, I think sitting in the direct sun like that with a full belly would be a little bit warm. Uh, you will hear the other game drive vehicles here um, having a chat and starting up and moving every now and then. I think that's one of them moving out. A 
Oh, look at that. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? Now, as we've noticed with all the cubs we've seen born over the last few years, Christine, yes, it's it's pretty much a 50-50 shot to whether the cub is a male or female. Uh, if we look at Hasana and Shongile, male and female, and um, before that, Karula had two boys in, in, in quarantine in Kunyuma. Uh, Shadow had quite a few female cubs and only one male cub and he's the only one who survived Sindile there we go look at that look at those eyes aren't they piercing ever aware and ever alert Now, Tundi has been spot on in, in terms of her hunting this week and has managed to catch a Stenbok. Hasana, however, has not been so lucky. Let's go find out from Ralph. Now, everyone, I have heard some uh, squirrels alarm calling and I have a feeling that there might be uh, a predator down in this drainage line. So we're just having a look and it is potentially Hosana, it might be Tingana, Hosana, uh, because this is the area that they've been hanging out recently. And speaking of Hosana, we've also uh, spotted him a couple of times uh, doing a little bit of hunting. Uh, he's tried his luck with a couple of little scrub hairs, which he's been unsuccessful at. Um, and well, you know, sometimes they just don't really put that much effort into small little um, uh, prey species like that. So uh, in, in terms of that, I'd like you to take a look at this. Having found Osana near Chitwa Dam at night with the spotlight, we switch to infrared night vision and watch as he half-heartedly attempts to hunt a scrub hare unsuccessfully. I think he may be after something with a bit more meat on it. Behind us there. So, oh, sorry everyone, we're just in a little bit of an area where there might not be that great signal for the radio because coming down into a dip here and uh, the, there's some squirrels alarm calling here. That's why I'm making a real point of coming down here to have a look because that's one of the real clear cut signs of a leopard in the area. And um, well, Hosanna has not only tried to catch uh, uh, some of the scrub hairs, which is not a great meal for him to expend energy on. So it's not, the, you know, the energy that he puts out versus what he gets. It's almost like, uh, you know, uh, running a marathon to get a, a small sized mini pizza, if I can say something like that. So he'd rather be going for like small kudu, even uh, some impala. But with the bigger sized animal, the bigger sized prey comes more danger. So let's um uh, let's have a look at him maybe trying to have a go at a bit of bigger prey like that under the cover of darkness Hosanna is in his absolute element scanning the terrain for potential prey he moves stealthily as only leopards can and if that isn't enough he exhibits his extreme climbing ability taking his viewpoint to another level marvelous was that with Hosanna and him hunting in parlor very very athletic up the tree and we've stopped here at a food source that Hosanna is also quite interested in last week we had him just around the corner from where we are interested in a male Nyala about this size but the reason why we've stopped is that this male Nyala is very interested in the young lady next to him that he's shielding now with his body he has tried to mount her a couple of times already and uh, she has not yet allowed him to but he is patient you can see him listening I've never heard of or seen a male leopard kill a Nyala I think they are just too big an animal 
females though, they do fall prey. If you could see her hiding behind him there. See, he's not even bothered in the eating. He's just interested in one thing. There she is. What's on your mind, fella? So the, the Nyalas don't go through the same sort of rutting season that the Impala do. Uh, this guy's exerted dominance and he will mate with as many females as he can. They're not seasonal, but they do potentially get distracted during this, making, there we go, making it potentially easier for them to be preyed upon. And you can see she's not paying attention at all. Her head is down. Uh, having your head down is a very difficult position to be in if you're trying to watch out for predators. There we go. <laughs> that was um, that was short and sweet. He's not finished yet. Bobby, you want to know about the tips of the horns? Well, um, the different color there. They call that the ivory tip, and uh, it's apparently to show maturity in, in the horn, but it's also a growth point. I think it's still growing a little bit from there. Uh, why exactly it's that color, I find it, I really don't know. But it's often something that some people have mentioned before, and I thought was the truth, is that it indicates age and maturity, but it's also quite strong and sharp, those ivory tips. But I don't know if it does, in fact, indicate age. But this is a fully mature male, and I'm not sure what he's doing right now. He's doing a black-bellied busted head dance, it seems. <laughs> What's he doing, Bully? He's clearly not interested in eating, but he's not distracted enough. I mean, he's still very alert. What we see with the male in parlors this year is they're so distracted by the females that they... They don't even look around, but it, it appears as if he's smelling something in the air. There's not much of a breeze around. Very keen sense of smell. Maybe there's a lion lurking, who knows? We are in the heart of Juma right now. All the leopards and lions have been moving through this very busy area. We're just north of Twin Dams at the moment, and this is the road that Tingana likes to walk down, and he walked down through the Milwati drainage system just to our left hand side followed by his son only earlier this week before finding themselves on Chitwa Chitwa okay he's having time for a little snack so you can clearly see that that female is indicating that she's not only a browser but also a grazer with their head deep down in the grass feeding on the very nice luscious bits of green and they are not seasonal as I've said in their reproduction so they breed all throughout the year oh she is feeding on a little forb there she is a very pretty young lady it's potentially her first mating cycle So, as I said, we are in the heart of Juma. The predators move in and around all of these places. And let's see how they're moving. Let's go to James. The wilderness where our favorite characters live their often soap operatic lives was as busy as ever this week. Hukamuri and Shidulu appeared separately in the northwest. While the old boy, Tingana, his consort, Tandi, and his son, Hosanna, all played their parts in this week's drama. Tingana headed for the seclusion of the quieter neighborhoods around Chitwa, and Hosanna followed not far behind. The three Avoka males disappeared on Sunday last week, reappearing in the north of Juma five days later, while the Unkahumas made a tentative midweek visit to the eastern boundary. So I hope that gives you a kind of overview of exactly where everyone is. And also, I, you know, we talk about Juma and Chitwa a lot, and I think it's quite difficult sometimes for you to visualize where exactly those two reserves are. Obviously, there are no fences between any of those boundaries. They are just boundaries that we, as humble human beings, must respect, uh, property laws being what they are, that the animals can come and go as they please, and as you have seen, they do so. 
Now, on the far eastern side of Juma is what we call Cheetah Cut Line, which is uh, inescapably short of Cheetah most of the time. Uh, but there were the Inkuhuma Pride sitting there a little bit earlier. Nice to see them all there. And they're nice to see that they don't seem to be suffering any ill effects from the proximity of the Avoca males. And nice to see them going off on the hunt. The Inkahuma Pride makes a welcome return to Juma on Thursday. They scratch each other's itches and remove a few blemishes, in between bouts of very enthusiastic lion slumber. The young male is sprouting the beginnings of a wispy teenage mane. He's almost two now and starting to interpret smells differently as the hormones of adulthood begin to course through his body. Now, I don't think they managed to catch anything that evening, and they've hence since, or since, headed off further towards the east, and we think they may have had an interaction with the Avoca males. It's almost certain that they would have. But those young males who you met earlier this afternoon with Steve, probably not big enough to cause too much trouble with those very mature and able lionesses. This is my very favorite tree. It is called the... Oh, sorry, I missed that question. Can we have it again, Rebecca? It's called Manalcara mochisa, this tree, or the loaf of milkberries. Got delicious, delicious fruits. Ah, now, the <laughs> this is a very common query, and we had it, in fact, last week, about whether or not it's possible for lionesses to reject new males. Uh, Toby... Sorry about that. It is impossible for that to happen. They have no choice in the matter whatsoever. And the only thing that they can do is keep their distance and hope that the youngsters grow up beyond the age uh, that the new males will kill them. And I think those Nkuhuma youngsters are getting to that age. But, uh, you know, that young male you saw there, he's about just about two years old. He should be okay. Normally the cutoff is about a year, but we saw the Birminghams when they came in here, they killed a two-year-old lioness. And so it's not impossible that those youngsters who have yet to reach their two-year-old, two... Sorry, Senzor's doing some very odd uh, sort of movements to the camera there. Um, <laughs> that have yet to reach their second birthdays uh, will be killed by the evokers. But it's, you know, it's, it's impossible to say. But the females will have no say. You will see an interaction where they will chase towards them, uh, the males will run away, then they'll stop, and they'll realize that they're stronger, and they'll come back towards them, and it's fascinating to watch. But eventually that distance will close and close until the evokers come and investigate the pride, and then they have no choice, the females. It's often talked about whether or not a female will try and protect her cubs with her life will she ever sacrifice herself for the good of her youngsters now in the case of a pride like the Inkuhumas with none of the cubs suckling almost to the point where they can probably hunt for themselves the chances are those females will put up slightly more of a fight if they were very tiny cubs there would be absolutely no point because of course without mother they will die inevitably regardless so it's a very interesting and dicey balance that takes place during a pride takeover i think it's quite interesting though because those males are young they're slightly too young to be taking a territory and they're very lucky to be in this area void at the moment of any dominant male lions and i think because they're younger and because they haven't experienced such uh, sort of physical trauma and violence that normally accompanies a territorial takeover what i think you'll find is that they don't have their blood up the testosterone levels are nearly as high as the birmingham's were when they came into this area with a huge grunt they'd obviously fought a lot before and i think you might find that they just kind of integrate quietly in here like uh, the millennials they are without too much of a buy or leave so i don't think it's going to be too traumatic with any luck all righty now it is a uh, I must say it's been something wonderful to watch Tristan getting to know the Maasai Mara and he had an excellent time up there with the cheetah this week.
just as flabbergasted as you are, I've managed to get all of my stuff packed up, some essentials that I needed, considering the rain that we've had, put them on, and firmly plop myself down in the Masai Mara. Now, that's not very comfortable. Let's not pop that. There we go. That's a little bit better. So it's really good to be here in the Mara itself, as much as I've been missing out in Juma. It seems as though the boys have had the most marvelous time in the sort of southern parts of South Africa. Here in the Mara, it has been absolutely spectacular. We have had a lot of rain, but it is really good to finally kind of land down in here and start to get to know some of the things that have been happening. Now, we were talking about male lions down in Juma, and we had a very interesting sighting of our own this week of a male lion who, well, had to tuck his tail between his legs. Buffalo have spotted the sausage tree pride, and the proverbial game of cat and mouse is about to begin. The buffalo begin to close ranks and present a united front. Two of the females suddenly break from the herd and send the pride fleeing. In doing so, they manage to separate the pride male, leaving him to fend for himself. At first, he struts defiantly back towards the pride, but is soon sent fleeing like a cat on a hot tin roof. Now, you would think with a face like this and teeth like that, that the cat would have had the upper hand when it came to that buffalo interaction. Unfortunately, though, the sausage tree pride was sent scampering in every direction as they tried to go after them, and in particular the male lion, which to me was highly entertaining. We had a situation where he was kind of sitting on a rock looking all beautiful and smug that he had found himself a safe place. Little did he realize that the rest of the herd had circled around the back of him and came busting out the bushes to him, chasing him away and so he ended up having to do a rather quick exit and run back towards the pride but it's been really good to kind of finally get my teeth into the lions of the Mara and to start to learn about them and I must say I'm fast becoming a big fan of the sausage tree pride they're a large big group of lions much bigger than a lot of the other prides that I've seen so far and watching them going about their business particularly with the buffalo has been absolutely amazing so far now James the my Migration movements, it's going to be interesting. Obviously, I'm still kind of learning a little bit more about what goes on, but given that we've had so much rain, not only here in, in Kenya, but also down south into the Serengeti, it's meant that the migration is still very far south at the moment. So we've spoken to a few people, and a lot of, a lot of them are indicating that the migration is actually sitting right down towards the Ngorogoro crater. And so most of the wildebeest are down here at Lake Ndutu and are slowly but surely now starting to worm their way northwards. As they come northwards, they'll eventually come up all the way to the Masai Mara, where I think we're going to start to see them coming in in the southwestern corner. There was a massive fire in that area, which means the grass is short and lush and green and absolutely perfect for wildebeest to come and graze. Now with that, I would imagine that we're going to start to see a number of the lions actually starting to move about a little bit, and they'll start to maybe shift and move slightly in order to try and take advantage of the first wildebeest coming. What I have noticed is, since I've been here is that there's very few prey animals for the lions at the moment. While there are big herds of buffalo, most of them are specializing in, in warthogs, and that makes it quite difficult for them. The grass is super long, and it makes it really tough to actually see those warthogs at the moment. So what we're finding is that the lions are moving quite big distances so what I think we'll see is as the migration arrives, you might find that the lion's distances that they move might just get a little bit smaller as more prey animals will be around and they'll be able to find food a lot easier than what they are right now. It's been very difficult for them and, and we've watched lions marching up and down all over the triangle trying to sort of find out what's going on. Now, sitting bull, the migration theoretically should be starting at the end of next month. So normally we see the first few wildebeest arriving at the end of March, I mean May, and so we'll have a situation where they should start coming in there and then into June, July, August, and then out of the Mara and the Mara Triangle at that period. This year, like I say, it might be a little bit later given that we've had a lot of rains and we've had a lot of a situation where there's been massive downpours. I would imagine a situation that we're going to see a lot of our wildebeest actually kind of coming a little bit later. Right, now, talking about the boys down in Juma, let's send you across to Steve who's got a spotted something that isn't a cat. <laughs> yes, we do. And it's so nice to hear from Tristan. Um, so nice, I'm sure he's enjoying himself up in the Masai Mara. And here we have got ourselves a very big male giraffe. That's the Unkuhuma pride, which would most certainly have a hard go trying to pull him down. He is enormous, five and a half meters. 
but look how low down he can feed. No problem, feed as low down as he wants to, as high up as he wants to. No competition for these guys. The only difficulty they have is, as any of you were with me a few weeks ago, we saw one male come down to Bifelsuk Dam and attempt to drink, and he didn't drink. He eventually gave up because lowering your head is a very difficult ask when you're an animal this size. It puts you at a lot of risk when you have big, hungry male lions around, and generally you need male lions in a pride to assist in the pull-down of an enormous giraffe like this. They have sensational backward kicks and forward karate chop kicks and it is a size 20 shoe with a big hoof and a very powerful leg. So lions will attack these guys at their peril and it pays to attack them on on mass all at the same time try and get the head onto the floor by well, avoiding those very powerful very flexible legs. Beautiful creature. I was hearing Tristan's voice earlier and how excited he was up in the Mara to be seeing what he's seeing up there and to have a herd of buffalo like that chasing lions is just phenomenal to see. Male giraffe is busy eating the pods of that tree. And he's keeping his eyes very vigilant because you never know what could be sneaking up on them. As Tristan up in the Maasai Mara had a very special sighting sometime this week. I'm not sure when, but let's go and have a look. The most incredible afternoon here in the Mara. It was actually my first afternoon, and as we were trying to escape from this massive storm, Archie and I came across something very, very interesting. Just come across a lioness that is starting to hunt some giraffes. So she's in the long grass at the moment, kind of stalking her way through, and there's a whole bunch of giraffe that are not too far away at all. There's a little baby giraffe that is a bit separated from the rest, and nobody has any idea that this lioness is closing in. And look at the camouflage that she's got. There she goes. Look at that, look at that, look at that chase. Unfortunately, I think the giraffe's gonna get away. She's given up the chase. She just went maybe a little early, but you see how she waited until they all turned and then she ran. I think she's unfortunately the giraffe have gone, but how amazing was that? Now, how incredible was it to watch that lioness go after that herd of giraffe? It was absolutely amazing to see her trying all by herself. It was really the most phenomenal scene. We had this epic thunderstorm, lightning bolts striking down across the Mara River, and this lioness just ghosting through these plains. And she got really close, actually, in the end. I think if there had been maybe another pride member with her, it would have been a very different scenario for that poor little giraffe. But it is amazing just to watch how she, she kind of figured it out. And she was using the road really carefully. So as we were kind of coming down the road, she was actually coming up the road a little bit like this and she was using in a very steep embankment that was there and so she kept going and then she would stop and she would kind of look up over the grass, over the grass and then eventually she found an exact straight line to that giraffe and then she walked straight at it and it was slow and steady and it took her about, I would say, probably about 25 minutes to 30 minutes to actually stalk maybe 20 meters and she went right down onto her tummy and then she slowly kind of crept forward and it was just millimeters at a time time and she got really really close it was absolutely phenomenal to see now philip i would imagine that any lions not even the lions here in the Masai Mara, but most lions would probably have a situation where the last resort that they would go after in terms of prey animals would be elephants they are really very very dangerous for them massive animals that are incredibly powerful and even the babies are protected by a big herd and so it makes it really tough for them to go after that and and you'll find that very seldom do lions hunt elephants except in certain certain parts of Botswana and maybe some other areas where other prey animals are difficult to come by, they might try to start doing that out of desperation. But elephants, rhino, hippos, those are all kind of things that are sort of last on the menu for lions. They far prefer to hunt most of these sort of antelope species that we get throughout Africa. It's a much easier situation for them to go after things like wildebeest and warthogs than it is massive six-ton elephant bulls. So find that they sort of shy away. And in fact, actually, we had a situation this week where we had a pride of lions that was 
chased around by a herd of elephants. And they often do end up that way where they kind of all have to tuck their tails and end up running off into the distance. But that particular sort of sighting was, like I say, a serious introduction into the Mara. It was an absolutely amazing thing to kind of see. And like I say, with the storms, it's just been so good to kind of watch how they use these sort of storms to be able to go after their prey animals. Now, Monique, in terms of the sausage tree pride members, well, you have a situation where you have one big dominant male that is quite large and very ginger in coloration. He's got a little slit on the right side of his nose, so quite easy to identify. And then you have two sub-adult males, well, did I say sub-adult, but they're starting to get a little bit bigger now. In fact, they very much resemble the same size as the avocas. One of them has got a very big scar on his nose, and it actually looks like he's been in a fight, and his whole nose is kind of swollen out. Shame, he looks a little uncomfortable, and I can think the flies have been driving a bit crazy. And then it's five females, the kinky-tailed lioness and four others. The interesting thing, though, is that in the sighting that we had when the lions were chased by the buffalo, we definitely noticed that one of the females is heavily, heavily pregnant at the moment. So hopefully, we'll have a little bit of an addition to that pride at some point in the near future because it would be wonderful to see if we can find those little cubs. I reckon that she's probably between a week and three weeks from giving birth. She's very heavy at the moment and her tummy has dropped quite a bit so I'm hoping that we are going to have little lion cubs and it should theoretically be somewhere off of this area. There's as Jamie mentioned earlier as they've been hanging around this section and there's a little kind of lugger that runs parallel with this road and where they've been spending a lot of time is very close to that lugger. So I would imagine that we're going to see a situation where they're going to get into that lugger and maybe give birth to those little ones, which will be so exciting for us. It really is a, a sort of good prospect for what's going forward and, and hopefully just in time for her to give birth for the migration season when all the wildebeest will arrive in this sort of southern section of the triangle. So lots of good things to look forward to. And I think also there's one other lioness that might have cubs. It looked like there were a few suckle marks there as well. So we don't know cubs-wise, but otherwise five lionesses, two sub-adult males and a big male. Now, talking of cubs and all things little, Brent is with my absolute favorite, and I'm very jealous. Well, we're still with Tandi and Chalamba, and uh, she started feeding on the carcass. Oh, there's Chalamba's head. She's been playing with mom's tail. We actually haven't been able to see her. We've basically just seen her head popping out of the grass. There she is. Hello, little one. You've been hiding for the last little while. There she is. Every time mom, mom's tail sort of popped up, she's uh, attacked it. And you can see that lovely light. Mom's feeding off the Sternbok. And, uh, oh, look at that light on little Tlalamba. Even though she is through the sticks and grass and bush, it is really spectacular. Now, at about her age, Tiva, she can eat, uh, in a single sitting, probably a good two kilograms, maybe even two and a half kilograms of meat in a single sitting. Uh, as she gets older, of course, she's going to be able to eat more and more. Look at her, isn't she beautiful? Mom's head is in the steering box, so to speak. She's concentrating on munching. We just hear the crushing of bones. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Uh, as I say, I think they'll finish this carcass off probably by tomorrow afternoon. And then it's back to the hard work of hunting for Tandy again to feed for this little one. There we go, she looks like, oh, it's getting to that time of the day. She might take it up the tree. Uh, Kia, Tandi will not take a live kill to Tlalamba uh, as, a, as a normal rule. Sometimes it does happen if she happens to kill something close by, but as a rule, she will not normally, leopards do not normally bring live kills back to their the young. Okay, let me move forward. Oh, no, we're not going to have time. I don't think, Dave, she's going right up straight away. So there we go, that's awesome. So she's going to keep it nice and safe. And up comes Tlalamba. Tlalamba is bounding up straight after mom. Okay, let me move forward where we can get a bit of view. It's 
to win, Dev. There. Okay. I'll stop there. So we go. There's little... Oh! Mom dropped something. Go fetch it. <laughs> Probably not. Pradeep, you are spot on. Little cubs, even much younger than Tlalamba, are able to climb trees to escape predators. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely gorgeous. And she's chuffing at Tlalamba. Tlalamba, up you go. Up you go, little one. And you can see she's got quite a big belly. Tandy looks like she might come down. So she's put it up there to keep it safe from hyenas. She might feed a bit more. There we go. Oh, look at that. Chuff, chuff. Now oh, it's going to be interesting to see if Tandy comes down to Lumbers in the way, and we have a little traffic jam up on the on the branch. Now, as a first form of defence, Stacy, the leopard will hide in a thicket or in long grass. Only if the predator then comes, or the potential threat comes closer and closer, will the the little cub then scurry up a tree. There we go, look at that, isn't that beautiful in that gorgeous light. Now she has been in the thickets for most of the afternoon, but she is treating us to some splendid visuals at the moment. trying to decide whether to go up or down or to just lie right there. It looks like right there has been decided as the spot. That light is magical. There we go. Here comes mom down the tree. I'm very, very happy she has put it up the tree too high for the hyenas to get at. Now, Tandy should be safe from hyenas with that kill nice and high up in the tree. But she's not the only leopard that's had problems with hyenas this week. Shadulu had a run-in herself. As Shadulu moves through the bush, something catches her attention. A small herd of Nyala on the other side of a Tumbuti thicket. She stalks closer, but is spotted by an alert female Nyala. We stay with her on patrol. As day turns into night, she scampers ahead to avoid a hyena. The hyena is on her scent trail and doesn't give up. She leaps into the low branches of a marula, waiting for the hyena to move off. The hyena disappears into the darkness. She descends and merges into the night. And look at that, Tandy is equally at home in the trees as she is on the ground, giving herself a little bit of a bath after eating on that fresh Stenbock carcass. Oh, this is just too magic. We got our patience has definitely paid off when it comes to the light. And uh, the light is fading now, but we were here for the most absolute magic. Now, we're not going to spend too much more time here. As it gets darker, we're going to zone this area because of the age of the cub. So we don't want any undue pressure 
on this sighting after dark um, so we will leave this area as it gets a little bit darker but for the moment we're still fine and someone was asking who would win a fight a leopard or hyena I'm sorry I didn't catch the name there it was a car dark aurora and thank you for your question dark aurora uh, it all depends a big adult male leopard like Hukumuri could possibly battle off one hyena but as soon as there's more than one it's 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 over hyena have strength in numbers often that will be able to let them chase off leopards when it comes to female leopards a single hyena would win the battle and especially when they have cubs female leopards tend to be a lot more cautious Oh, look at her looking. Oh, gorgeous. Absolute magic. You don't get many better afternoons out here in the African bush than this. And here we go. Now we've got to go. Wait, what? Jump over? Oh! <laughs> Silly little one. That's what happens when you block the way. I'll just jump to another branch. Yeah, just behind there you can see her lying down on the low branches. What's going to be Tundi's next move? Is she going to come down? And you can see she's got a nice belly developing there. The temperature is dropping rapidly. And you can see, compared to when we saw her this morning, she has definitely got a baby, or a food belly, not a baby belly, she's got a food baby, I think that's what I meant to say, got my words all muddled up there, she's got a food baby. What is she spotted behind me? I can't see anything. So I can't see anything just yet behind me. But isn't that gorgeous? She's definitely watching something behind the vehicles. She might just be being cautious, and, and it always pays to be cautious when you're a leopard. There's always potential hyenas and all sorts around. Now, we're going to send you all the way back to Kenya at the moment. Now, the hyenas here have a bit of an easier time than some of the hyenas up east in Kenya because of course some of those lions You're back with us. Uh, I think there must be a little bit of a tech issue. Uh, let's just go lap back a little bit so we can see little Chalama. Hello, you little scallywag. Watching me through the boughs of the tree. You can see her there. There we go. Hello, you little scallywag. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? As the temperature drops, she is getting more and more playful. Now, it all depends, Marcy, on the individual leopards. Normally, female leopards become independent. Uh, from their mother a little bit younger than male leopards would but she'll probably stay with her mom to between 16 and 18 months old if the circumstances are ideal oh isn't she sweet Uh, 
fleeting interest. I think I'm trying to remember how many Cubs Tundies raids to Independence. I know of Bahuti and Tumba and Kochava. That's the three I know of, but there could be a few more uh, from before my time. I meant to ask actually Tristan because he, he was at Chitwa when she was quite young, Tandy. There we go. Hello, little one. So there's our other vehicles coming in now as well but as I say as it gets darker probably in about 15 or 20 minutes or so I'm going to close this area okay we're going to try again to send you all the way up north to the Mara to see what the lions and hyenas have been up to. Again, I think I blame the umbrella. It seems to be really bad luck to try and open one indoors because it's caused all sorts of problems. But we're back and I can tell you what I was trying to tell you. You probably just got hand gestures. We were talking about the fact that it pays to be cautious if you're a leopard. It also pays to be cautious if you're a lion or if you are a hyena. Now, the sausage tree pride taught some hyenas a very important lesson about always being cautious. Have a look. Sausage tree pride have finally managed to get the better of the buffalo herd. And as the day heats up, the bursting lionesses finally give in to the heat and move off to the shade. The eager hyenas have forgotten a cardinal rule. There is always a lion that hasn't been spotted. As their desperation for scraps makes itself known, one hapless hyena nearly meets an unfortunate end. The lioness's full belly makes her clumsy, and the desperate gymnastics of the hyena allow it to escape, only to run straight into the vengeful male. With its bottom trying to outpace its head and screaming all the way, the wretched hyena is well and truly sent packing. I'm just practicing, just in case that is a really effective way of seeing off a lion because it certainly worked for that hyena. And I've rumpled my shirt. I hope no one says anything. So, we had that incredible sighting. Now, back when the Sausage Tree Pride was still in their old area, they would have fallen into the North Clan Territory region. But where they've moved to now is actually the rival clan of the North Clan's, or the North Clan's territory, and that is the Happy Zebra Clan. So that was one of the Happy Zebra Clan members that was caught and roughed up a little bit by that broken-tailed lioness. So there you go. We've been talking about how she really often takes the lead in the hunts that we've seen, the hunts that we've witnessed. They're also one of the few prides that we've actually really seen target large animals, whether it's buffalo or giraffe. Something interesting about their approach, Where and I know that Tristan was chatting a little bit about that as well. But because she's so easily identifiable. That broken-tailed lioness has actually built up something of a reputation in the Maasai Mara. All of the guides talk about her in sort of hushed tones, as if she were the, the most um, incredible hunter in, uh, in lion terms that they have ever seen. I suspect that's partly because of her broken tail, but as we spend more time with her, we'll get a chance to know a little bit better. I also think that probably because she's one of the older lionesses in the pride, she starts to take the lead in quite a few of the um, the things that require more teamwork between the various lines of that pride. Oh, who knows where, where she'll lead us. Marcy, the reason that they were called the sausage tree pride um, originally came from a, a sausage tree is a beautiful, big, very striking tree. And there's a number of them down sort of in the plains areas. We see them and they stand out because they don't grow together in clumps or anything like that. You'll see one sausage tree and it's very big and beautiful and it's very, very clear. It's got a fruit that looks like a large dried 
sausage. And the reason that they got that name was because they spent a lot of time underneath the sausage tree areas. Um, there's a sausage tree, a particularly spectacular sausage tree, that is mm, sort of in the middle of their territory. And I suspect that's where they got their name from. So a lot of the prides out here are named according to the area that they're in. So the sausage tree pride, we've got the Owinio pride, which is the previous small sausage tree pride. They're up towards the Owinio area and the escarpment. We've got the Olololo pride towards Olololo gate. A lot of the naming follows the various areas and they tell you, it tells you a lot about where the lions are actually based. Black Rock pride, for example, around the Black Rock area. Salpic pride would be another, another very good example. So a lot of the lions are named after the area that they're in. There's Serena, Paradise Pride, named after the Paradise Plain, and of course Scar is one of the dominant males in that area. At the moment, with the river being as flooded as it is, they actually can't make their way across, or he can't make his way across there, I don't think. I can't imagine he would ever put himself trying to swim across that river. The wildebeest will have to, but by that stage, I imagine that the river would have slowly started, started to go down. Right, so we've spoken all about that. We're going to send you all across to Juma, where they are just about to enter their dry season. And uh, indeed we are, and we've got little Chalamba, uh-oh, playing rather than feeding. She's going down a very skinny little peltiform branch. And uh, I've seen lots of little leopard cubs fall from this position, except I don't think she's realized that the tree below is thorny. Very, very thorny. A knob thorn, in fact. Uh-oh. If you fall out of there, it's gonna hurt, little madam. So you will hear some other people in the sighting. What are you doing, Kalamba? Here we go. Let's just go eat. There's no need to play suicide on the edge of that. Or oh, I suppose what's what's the other game people play? Chicken. Yeah, there we go. She looks like she's not really interested in eating or interested in just fooling about. I think Tundi is now headed off down towards a, a little mud, mud wallow next to the, the, the road for a drink. Now, it all depends, Fluffy Ossicones. Uh, when a mother leopard might discipline the cub. Normally it's just a snarl or a growl is all that is needed. It's very, very seldom that they get flattened by the adults. Here we go. Chalamba is now having a snooze. I think I'm going to go try f see uh, Tandy having a drink while the little one has a, has a snooze on the branch. Oh, look at that. The head or backwards, upside down. Isn't this wonderful? And she is absolutely gorgeous. Okay, let's go see if we can have see mom having a drink down near the road. Hi guys. Okay. Well, sorry, we're live at the moment. I'll touch you now. Sorry. Um, we're going to send you back across to Steve, who's still looking for. Lions or leopards? I don't know which. Well, we're going to head back towards the Evoca males. Uh, they have been flat this whole time. There's been a few vehicles coming in and out, and I've been listening on the radio to the movements, but last I heard they were still flat, but the temperature's dropping. This is the time of day when cats like to start moving around. This is the time of day we often find predators such as Tingana moving around. In the other afternoon, Seb and myself, was it the morning? It was the afternoon. Yes, it was the afternoon. We found Tingana walking from Chitwa Waterhole, and it was very cool how he was behaving. We follow Tingana moving slowly through Chitwa Chitwa. We move with him as he slinks through the tall grass in search of an easy meal. He spots some water buck slowly moving in single file towards Chitwa Waterhole. Watch him calculate and then crouch 
as each water buck passes desperately out of his reach. He patrols along Chitra's northern boundary, sniffing as he goes, scent marking with real intent, holding fast to this small piece of land. The Duke is an outcast from his once proud territory. And so it was marvelous spending time with the old Duke as he, first of all, did all sorts of scent marking behavior in Chitwa, walking away from the waterhole. He was trying to hunt, wasn't showing too much interest in the hunting. Timothy, you want to know about it, Hosanna and Tingana. Now, I don't know if they would fight. I don't think Hosanna's quite at the age yet to compete for territory. And every time we see them interact, they kind of like, he plays the game and dad plays the like, I'm bigger than you and stronger than you kind of vibe. But there hasn't been any sort of physical confrontation. I, I don't think they would fight. That's my personal opinion. But I've never seen anything like this before. So I can't really tell you. But we were watching him. And it was very busy because uh, Tingana was right on the boundary line there with Chitwa and Torchwood. So lots of cars coming in and out. And then we managed to spy him trying to kill some water buck. But uh, his calculations were a little bit off on the pathway. But the pathway that he ended up lying on was where the previous water buck had crossed the road. And what was interesting to me is because everyone was concerned he was going to cross the, the northern boundary of Chitwa into Torchwood. But he never did. He kind of stayed on the road kept walking, kept smelling. Okay, I don't think Tengan will become nomadic. I think what we're seeing is his territory, which extended all the way into Juma, and who knows where else, is now just sort of shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And when we left him the other night, he was vigorously, vigorously scent marking once back in Chitwa. But on the boundary itself, he was just smelling. He wasn't doing anything. He didn't do any calling. So he's not advertising immediate presence, which Hukumuri is doing at the moment. And I think his, his, his sort of proud territory, or his proud territory, as I mentioned there, is slowly dwindling, and he's just holding on to what he can. And Osana seems to be quite happy to be following him all around and into these sort of areas and along the Mulwati drainage system, river system, all the way down to Chitwa. It's a very easy route, uh, very easy to navigate, and lots of animals along the way. So... So we're heading back up to the north to see what these evoker males are up to. And in the meantime, Ralph Kirsten has found a very small predator. Yes, and the sun has just dipped over the horizon. Uh, it's that time of the day that these little dwarf mongoose are now coming back to their den site. They've probably spent most of the day out foraging along with some of the hornbills. But uh, with the sun going down, well, they are diurnal animals, so active during the day. And uh, before going to bed, they all just do a little bit of aloe grooming and make sure that all their coats are in order. And then they go down into the hole for their night's rest. You can see they're a bit of scratching and just checking everybody out before they head down into their den. A wonderful sight to see these little carnivores. They... Um, They'll be feeding on all sorts of grubs and, and beetles. Now, I have never seen a leopard try to catch a dwarf mongoose. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I think, uh, firstly, the little mongoose, they are, they are so agile. And with so many eyes and ears, they normally pick up very quickly that there's a leopard in the area. But uh, for the leopard as well, the energy expended for him to be able to catch one of these little critters uh, would be uh, quite excessive for the amount of energy that he gains from it. And because they would be difficult because of the reasons mentioned. And um, yes, not much gain in, in food because he's going to have a little bite-sized snack. But these little critters, they will be eating things from snakes to rodents to beetles and all sorts. And, uh, well, they are the little uh, voracious predators. And normally denning in uh, these kind of termite mounds or termiteria that um, are extinct. So no more termites in, in them anymore. And we have been searching the entire area of Chitwa and no sign of Tingana or Hosanna. So um, 
Well, I'm not sure we're going to be lucky on that front today. But it doesn't always happen like that. And uh, we just uh, we enjoy it when we can find them and we see them regularly. But t this evening is not one of those days. But then we enjoy all the other small guys. And especially these little dwarf mongoose. Always fun to watch. But it's just about time for their bedtime. Lovely to watch. There's been all sorts of animals in the area. Now, I think uh, we're going to be heading you all the way back up north once again uh, to Jamie, who has got also lovely small little things to talk about. One thing that dens in a termite mound and one thing that absolutely doesn't den in a termite mound. And we're going to tell you a little bit about the North Clan and their denning processes. I just wanted to compare the skull of the hyena, which is this one over here, with the skull of the lion. And you can understand why that poor hyena was as terrified as it was firstly when it found itself in the grips of the lioness and then secondly when the, the male started to show serious intent in terms of catching it now we've shown you the happy zebra clan but of course you must all be wondering what has become of our wonderful north clan that we've spent so much time with well we've got a little bit of an update that i think we'll that you all enjoy after days of fruitless visits to the North Clan den site, we finally decided to make our way there before dawn. Lo and behold, our little pocket rocket has made an appearance and is alive and well and still enchanting as ever, if somewhat jumpy with all of the commotion around the den. We have believed for a while that Sour, one of the older females of the clan, is the mother of this little chap, just judging by her anxious behavior around the den. It will take a few more hours and some good luck to know for absolute certain. Our little one is still alive and well and we couldn't be more excited about it. So, if that little cub does belong to Sour, what will its name be? And the answer to that is, remember how we spoke last week about the lineages and how every female, her cubs are named according to a specific theme. In Sawa's case, and, and Sawa sits quite high up in the hierarchy, not one of the highest ranking, but quite high up in the hierarchy, Sawa's lineage is bears. Bears, as in the animal bear, not, not any other meaning of the word bear. So we've got black bear and there was Paddington, and there was Polar. Polar actually, we think, had a, had a cub at the den site, and her cubs are named after Beyonce songs. So, absolutely no connection there. She's had cubs called Deja Vu and Diva. Anyway, so Sawa's cubs are named after bears. And what that will mean is that essentially that little cub is either called Sloth Bear or Ghost Bear, or affectionately Slobber or Gruber. Now, MC, you want to know what's happened to Waffles? She was actually there that morning that the little cub came out. It's very difficult initially with hyena cubs in a clan this size to determine exactly which particular hyena is the mother. Would it be Waffles or would it be Sour? Judging from her behavior and her complete lack of concern, I don't think it was Waffles. So not Waffles, but possibly Sour. I need to put a little collar on one of these so that we can distinguish between the two. But Waffles is there. I don't know what's going to happen with that particular clan's den site. I suspect they're going to move. And the reason I suspect they're going to move is right at the beginning of this episode too, I showed you how um, one of the luggers or the drainage systems has actually got the river backing up into it. Now, all of the water comes down off the escarpment and it drains into this area here. And I think that, I think that might be... Um, I think that might be an area where they're going to struggle because it's all draining there. It should drain into Magoral, but it's not because Magoral is backed up. Night Owl, are the hyena cubs at risk of drowning? All little cubs are potentially at risk of drowning. It's quite unusual for hyenas to have that situation because the cubs can come out of the den. Little ones, 
Absolutely. So there might be some really, really tiny, relatively immobile cubs in that den site at the moment. We don't know because we won't see them in the initial stages of their life. So yes, there is a risk that they could drown in those den sites. We're hoping that isn't the case. The same applies for the lions. The lions have to pick their den sites very carefully. And remember how the Ollalolos chose that massive lugger to, to keep their little cubs in last year. If they were to have done that now, all of those cubs would have died because that lugger has been flowing consistently and it flash floods almost every, almost every single day that those, that those drug luggers actually flood. So yes, there's a possibility that the cubs could drown. I hope that's not the case. At the moment, unfortunately, I can't go there because the roads are so, so waterlogged that if I do, all I'm going to do is churn the mud and I'm going to wreck the road, not get anywhere, potentially get stuck, have to get out, disturb the hyenas at what is quite a sensitive time of their lives. So we don't know yet, but as soon as it dries out, then we will absolutely give it a go. Now, I mentioned that it was a beautiful evening here in the Mara, but I don't think you heard me when I said that. It is a beautiful evening here in the Mara. It is an equally beautiful evening on Juma. Yes, it is an equally beautiful evening, although it has been a very frustrating afternoon. We have found no sign of Shidulu and hoped that she would come out as evening fell, but all we've heard is the incessant noise of Impala rutting with each other. The final insult that the universe delivered to me today was when I came up onto this tree and found that, well, it is massively spiky up here and I now have pits in my left buttock. It is very, very unpleasant indeed. This is round about the time of day that you would expect lions to get up and go hunting and I can hear some. I wonder if those evoker males aren't calling up where Steve left them. Now that's very interesting because if they are, this is obviously the time that they would start calling and if they are calling, it means they're starting to feel a lot more comfortable that the Birmingham's, Birmingham are perhaps absent for good. So that's quite interesting stuff. Now, lions, as we know, like to get up during the evening. They are world-class sleepers, almost as good as presenters. But eventually, as darkness falls, they must find supper. Thursday afternoon is hot and the Unkahumas show no inclination to do anything other than sleep like the dead and move between shady spots. The wound on the oldest lioness remains deep and open but doesn't seem to hamper her movements. The pride is clearly in need of a good meal however. As the sun sets a few of the older cats wake, greet each other with tired enthusiasm and then try to cajole the lazy teenagers into helping with the night's hunting. Something catches their attention and they drift off into the eastern darkness. Now, of course, I need to try and get out of here. Anyway, I don't know if they managed to catch anything, those Ninkapumas. Uh, excuse me? My radio. What about it? It's stuck on what? Oh. God, you see, I mean, it really has not been my day. I think I'll just stay up here, um, possibly for the night. Right, OK, there we go. Um, <laughs> what did I want to say? Oh, yes, this is where our search began for Shidulu. We heard Kudu Alarm calling down that away, and, uh, well, that was the last we on Bushwalk managed to have a fair. We did track her the whole morning, in case you're wondering why I'm so frustrated, and I've just measured the distance we've walked tracking that leopard today. 16.6 uh, .6 kilometres, which is a, an even 10 miles, which I think is quite far to track an animal that you haven't actually seen. Very depressing indeed. So the Inkahumas went off into Torchwood, which is east, into the night, as I said they were going to do there. And then I think they went up north, and I think they had an interaction with the Evokers. We don't know exactly but now those lions are calling. I hope Steve's going to go back there. Somebody who's had a substantially more successful day than I. In fact, three individuals that have had a substantially more successful day than I. Brent Tandy and Tlalamba. 
<laughs> we've had a wonderful day and uh, there's Tandy she's lying out and now that we're the only car here little Columba has been stalking up I think she's got a crash on dangerous Dave and his dimples oh no Dave she's turning her back on you but she's been sneaking closer and closer to the car now it is nearly dark so this is going to be our last little view of her I think she might be attempting to attack mom but it is getting dark even though we have infrared and uh, cannot use and can operate without lights around here we want to be sensitive because there's meat here because there's a young cub the potential of hyenas coming to investigate even the sound of us here after dark is quite high so we're going to leave them be till the morning and uh, as I said uh, even though we can operate in infrared I'm, I'm making the call not to just in case we put little Clalumba under threat and I think there's enough threats with all the male lions I mean not male, well the male lions and the male leopards all around at the moment so yes a little sweetness we're going to leave you and your mom to enjoy your night in peace and we're going to zone and close the area so we are the last vehicle out of here oh Tandy's up now uh, leopards have quite a few different forms of communication some of them non-visual some of them are sorry some of them visual and some of them um, audible oh <laughs> gotcha mom gotcha so uh, she'll normally just snarl or growl at an end of it at the cub when she wants it to stay and there we go isn't that absolutely magic uh, what a lovely little way to end our sighting here. As I say, as that gets darker and darker, you can see the beautiful colours in the sky. And what a magic day it's been. We were lucky enough to see Tandy catch the Stenbok, drag it back to Tlalamba. <sighs> Absolutely wonderful. So we're going to leave her be now. I'm going to send you all the way back a couple of thousand kilometers to Tristan in the Mara. We have, well, have been an epic day all round by the looks of things from the Sabi Sand side of things. And even here in the Mara, it hasn't rained, which is quite spectacular. And so I have ditched my MS Mara life boy and we've given it now to James, who we've affectionately named James. Jamie and I have decided this shall be James from now on. James the crocodile has now gotten its own little life boy to survive the Mara River as it floods. So at least it will be safe. Now, it's been a very good week here in the Mara, and, and while I've had many tawny acquaintances, obviously it's the spots that are closest to heart. And going outside of Juma and, and leaving all the leopard friends that I have behind there has been quite difficult to sort of swallow a little bit, and it's been hard. But at least here in the Mara, the one thing that I was really looking forward to was getting to know some of the spotted cats that are a little sleeker and a little faster. The long grass from the rains makes finding Naratoi and the boys near impossible. They soon awake and with a few glances and some tentative steps to ease the stiffness, it's time for play. The boys ease into things with a light jog, but suddenly, like a bolt out of the blue, Naratoi joins in and chases after her son in a game of tag. The boys are left bewildered at mom's sudden burst of energy. Now, thankfully, Naratoi and the boys are faring a lot better than my friend Charlie over here, who we've given a little scarf because it has gotten a bit cold this afternoon. But Naratoi and the boys are, are the first cheetah that I've managed to see here in the Mara, and it's, they were really a very big highlight of my week. I, they didn't really get up to too much, and it was a difficult area that they were in because of the rains that we've had. But just the playful nature of Naratoi and how she's interacted with those boys was something super special to watch, and it reminds me a lot of some of our leopards in the way that these mothers are so affectionate towards their boys and the way that they go about kind of raising them and, and looking after them is a very special thing and, and the sighting that we had, I had her two days in a row actually and both times there was just these games that were being played and she was actually teaching them a very valuable lesson while it looked like a lot of fun and they were chasing each other and they were kind of all over the place she was actually teaching the boys on how to chase and hunt so what she would do is she would run past and she would basically bite them on the bum and then speed off and the 
boys would catch up and they would jump on her and they would try and wrestle her and, and once she felt like they had gotten to the point where they were on top of her she would actually collapse down and then the boys would jump onto her sort of chest and throat area much like they were going to do with any of the prey animals that they're going to come across in life it was really very very interesting to watch and amazing anytime you watch a mother and her cubs play around now i was saying that they're in a difficult area so they're down right in the southwestern corner of the triangle at the moment and this whole section is very 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 damp there's actually a swamp that you can see over here and let's get rid of that quickly but there's a swamp that's in this whole area and it makes it not easy to negotiate at all and so we're going to have to wait a little bit more for it to dry out before we can go and spend time down in that section but i'm really looking forward to heading down there and the reason why is what i'll get into pretty shortly but but chris the five musketeer boys are still around they're still doing well i believe yesterday they managed to kill a wildebeest i don't know where a wildebeest was that they managed to get it but from what i understand is that they spend most of their time if this is where narratory and the boys are down right in the southwest of the triangle the boys are spending most of their time up in this section over here so this is the Talek River that comes along like this so they're all over this kind of area and spending a lot of time around there now with the flooding of these sort of drainage sections or luggers is going to be very interesting to see where they actually are and whether or not they're crossing back and forth as much as they used to they used to cross around the Talek region quite regularly from what I understand and obviously it's been a learning curve to try and work out where everybody is and we're not spending any time across that side at the moment so what we're getting is just updates from from guides in the area. Now I was mentioning earlier that it's really good to be spending time down with Naruto and the boys and there's another reason why I've enjoyed being down there. So as much as the cheetahs are an epic part of the Masai Mara, there is a spotted cat here that we all know that I look for often. And down in this section, around Cobra's Corner crossing and around Cobra's Corner and then down towards where these figurines are is a female with two cubs which I also had the pleasure of seeing this week which is very very cool they were up in a tree with a kill and so managed to see that too and so that area I think I'll be spending quite a little bit of time down there if that goes the way I would like it because well there's both spotted cats in numbers down there so it's a perfect place for me to head and to be able to do all of those kind of things Good. Now, while we carry on with our sort of week and see how we go, let's send you back across to Steve, who has managed to catch up with those three young boys. We have, we have found them and they were not calling. They have been very flat until now. There's the beautiful yawn, always the general precursor of the movement. Now, they are... We are in infrared at the moment, folks. The sun has set. It is getting rather dark. You can probably hear in the background the crested Franklins shouting the evening chorus. And this is the time that the lions start to wake up. What is our alarm clock in the morning is the lion's alarm clock in the evening, the crested Franklins, which can be rather annoying but very very effective so I'm not sure what lions James heard calling but it definitely wasn't these and they didn't even move if there were lions calling we didn't hear it and neither did these boys so maybe it's the Birmingham's on their way back in maybe it's the uh, Unkuhuma females who knows what is going on out there in the Sabi Sands wilderness And I'm sure Tristan is super excited to be finding leopards in the Mara. I was lucky enough to find one on my first morning there with Jamie. Ali, I think there's very good chance of seeing the Birminghams. I just don't know what they're doing. They seem to be um, obviously further south and it's probably likely that the females down there are reproductive and that's what's keeping them there. But uh, the Unkohumas aren't too far away from becoming reproductive again. But they should actually be back up here protecting their lineage rather than just trying to reproduce. But that seems to be what the Birminghams are doing. They're trying to run the entire Sabi Sands for themselves, which is a little bit greedy. They should share. And maybe this northern boundary with Manyaleti and the Kruger National Park will actually be ceded to these three males.
Monique, the, the reason behind the way females or why lions mate the way they do is there's always a bit of uncertainty. So it would be difficult for um, the Birmingham to know if it was his cub, if he's mated with her or if one of his brothers have. But if they haven't seen them and they know they haven't mated with them, ooh, that was a big yawn. I thought he was going to call there. If they haven't seen them and suddenly the female falls pregnant and has cubs, he'll certainly know it's not his. Maybe it's got to do with the smell. Uh, maybe it's got to do with the fact that he knows he didn't see that, that female for quite some time. And so he, it would lead them to kill. Well, generally, it doesn't always happen. It would probably lead them to kill the cubs. Uh, that's what these evokers would likely try and do if they manage to integrate themselves in this area. And they came across the Unkuhumas who seemed to be avoiding them. Um, they would try and kill the youngsters in that pride to make those females reproductive. So the Unkuhumas are doing everything they can to avoid these three young males. And hopefully the Birminghams will come up here for their vengeance and dis discipline these youngsters. But uh, we're going to go all the way back down from the north to the south and let's see if Ralph has managed to find the little chief. The little chief has unfortunately eluded us today. We have literally driven around Chitwa a number of times. And um, while well, Hosanna as well as Tingana have given us the slip. But nonetheless, it's uh, still a beautiful evening that is starting here over Chitra Dam. Uh, it's nearly full moon and there's lots of hippos still in the water. Uh, Taya, um, the reason Hosanna is following other leopards, uh, and especially uh, Tingana in particular, uh, I think is because of his young age, and he's quite special as a, as a solitary cat, almost seeking out uh, a bit of company, I believe. Uh, so I don't think it's anything to do with him being insecure. I think it's just that his character is um, uh, sort of pushing him to be around other leopards. So everybody's different and well, he's also one of those different characters and that's wonderful to see if all the leopards were the same Well, it would be a little bit boring wouldn't it? But look at that beautiful in the infrared light that we're using uh, And over Chitwa Dam, it's nearly full moon and um, well the surf's going to be getting good down on the ocean and well, let's just see if we can see that nice and clear. But I think tomorrow is full moon, if I'm not mistaken. But that's the end of the, the day for us, or the search for Hosanna on my side of things. And I'm just sitting here now listening to the conversation of the hippos. Julie, I think you're probably 100% correct. I hear that he likes hanging out at uh, room number 11. So I think um, he's probably sitting there waiting for his dinner. Either that or he's at camp um, waiting for the girls to go back to bed so that he can give them a fright. But um, right, uh, with that in mind, let's head you on back to Steve and um, uh, those are vocal males. <laughs> Hosanna, the little chief, is a marvelous creature. He does like room 11. And Rebecca and Kirsten in FC have seen him up close and personal because they like the new rooms at Juma as well. And uh, I noticed a story that didn't come up today, but myself and Dave were on walk with, Re with Herbie the other day, and we had the most amazing encounter with uh, the little chief on foot there by Voyatella Dam, which is, to me, the most awesome leopard encounter I've ever had in my entire life. And I've had quite a few, but every time we do it here on Juma, it seems to get better and better and better. No, Sharon, the roars you've been hearing are by no means coming from where we're sitting. We have northeast from the dam cam, and these animals have not made a sound since we've been here, and we haven't heard them at all this afternoon. So I don't know where those roars are coming from. That could be very interesting to investigate. I wonder how you can even tell if it's coming from the north or the south. But um, these lions are still quite flat, 
Uh, they're probably going to get up in a little while and do whatever it is that lions do at night. That's probably have some ablutions and then some drinking. And then like with the rest of the characters on the show, they're probably going to move in the darkness, even though the moon has risen and it is quite bright. It has been a marvelous afternoon. Brent with Tlalamba. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to find any of the other female leopards or male leopards. But we will be continuing our normal safaris throughout the week as per usual in the morning and the afternoon. And we'll be continuing with Safari Lives next Saturday at the same time. Thanks for all the questions and feedback from Namara, from Juma and everyone here. Thank you. Have a good night.